theme text is John 3, verse 16, and he makes it clear, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For us to be able to live forever, then we have to give our hearts to Jesus Christ. And then he come within us and work from within us and give us his gift. And as such, we have no transition from death to life. It's that easy. So we give you Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why we're here to worship Jesus Christ, because he's worthy. Not only is he the creator of the heavens and the earth, he's also the one who sustains and maintains lives. Not only does he create and sustain and maintain lives, he died on Calvary Cross to redeem us. And not only does he, he redeem us, but he gone to prepare a place for us, as we share with you on last night's show, John chapter 14 from verses 1 to 3 is going to prepare a place for us. And where he is, he will take us with them. But until then, we have a great work to do. And the work that we have to do is to encourage you in the Lord. So I want, again, we want to welcome those near and far. For those who are with us from the Zoom platform, we say welcome. For those from Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and TCVFM Christian Radio. I want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. It is also a part of our custom to ask God, the Holy Spirit, uh, to lead us going forward. So I ask you now, please just to bow your head with me as I ask God, the Holy Spirit, uh, to lead us going forward. Good God of heaven, it is such a great privilege to come into your holy presence one more time. A new day with a new opportunity to worship the only true God, the one who spoke this world into existence, and the one who died in Calvary Cross to redeem us unto himself. Father, we come into your presence. If there's any thoughts, words, or deeds that we have done that will separate us from you because of our sins, we ask you now for, for, for your forgiveness. And now, oh God, that we are boldly before you, we just want to worship you in the spirit, in spirit and in truth. And finally, O oh God, for those among us that are sick physically, spiritually, and mentally, I pray, Father, that you will work a, miracles, work a miracle in us. In, your, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Barnaby. It's good to be with you as usual. I think this discussion is quite relevant to the discussions we've been having recently on freedom because we have been getting into some deep philosophical discussions where we have to exercise our reasoning powers to weigh the evidence for or against the existence of God. And so as we think about those kinds of difficult discussions, it's important to remember that as Christians, we need to be able to give a reason for the hope that is in us. Blind faith is not gonna be good enough uh, when we seek to share our faith with people who are informed in the world today. And so uh, it's good to know that God is the source of our faith and also the source of our power to think and to reason. So God doesn't have any problem with us enter into a dialogue with him. That's for sure. In fact, he says, come, let's reason together. Ah. Come, let's reason together, says the Lord. So God wants us to think he wants us to raise questions. He's okay with that. So he's a, he's a God big enough to enter into a reason. Now, my question to you now, how do you deal with the reasoning with God when he enter into a dialogue with, for example, Job? And he looked at Job and said, Job, where were you when I was created the world? And how do you, how do you distinguish between when God usurped his authority and said, I am God, reason, reason with me. <laughs> well, this is the way it is uh, on a human level as well, isn't it? If you're a student in a class, then you need to respect the authority of the professor to teach you how to think. And so it is when we come to reason with God, we need to recognize that God is the one who can teach us how to use our reasoning power. But the story of Job is not a, a story that that causes us to, to think we should shut down our questioning of God. In fact, the book of Job is a book filled with Job being bold enough to raise questions to God. And God welcomes the questions, but he simply points out to Job that you've asked questions that you can't handle the answers to. 
God still regards Job as a perfect man. In fact, that's how the book of Job begins. Job was a perfect man and upright, but his knowledge was limited. And God, as the master teacher, had to point that out to him. And so it is with us today. We sometimes think we know better than God, but, but God is the ultimate source of reason, and he can help us use our reason correctly. Is it, is it fair to say, um, you, using you as, as a teacher, where you, you're now teaching both master students that are trying to get their master's degree and students that are trying to get their PhD, and are you saying now the way in which you are your expectation from a student who are trying to get a master or a PhD is different from, for example, a student that just first begin the first um, kindergarten and the first grade. So God, maybe in one way to describe maybe the dialogue with Job, uh, God was on the level, I'm not saying God is, but as just for demonstration, on the level of of a PhD student or a PhD professor talking to Job from a kindergarten level and Job cannot fully comprehend at certain levels so God was helping him to think in the proper context so he can uh, understand the issue at hand. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah. One of the key things in reasoning is to recognize the limits of reason. <clears throat> if we think that reasoning by itself can provide all the answers that we need, we're going to be disappointed. And that's why our study a few moments ago was on faith and reason. We need to keep both of these human abilities sharp. We have the ability to believe, to have faith, to trust God, and we also have the ability to reason and to think and to understand God. But the two abilities must be used in harmony with each other. If, if we want to go all the way to God with just reasoning but no faith, we're going to fall short. And if we want to go all the way to God with, with just blind faith, with no reasoning, maybe that faith is, is a counterfeit faith. So we need our faith and our reason to go hand in hand. And God was helping Job with that. And he is seeking to help us with that, to learn how to, to be faithful and reasonable at the same time. I, I want to I wanna go back to the first text that you share with us, Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. I want to read it in the area, in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the presence of all of us, and then I want to pose a question, and then also I want to open up for the audience to join in the discussion as well, because I know um, there are many people uh, that are excited about entering into a, di into a dialogue, dialogue with you. And uh, also, I just want to use this opportunity to just welcome those that just join us, those of maybe from Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or T um, TCVFM Christian Radio. We want to thank you for joining us. We understand that some of you are from Europe, uh, from Asia, from um, North America, from all over the world. And so we want to welcome you. Uh, if on Wednesday, we have Dr. Martin Hanna with us. Dr. Martin Hanna is a systematic theologian teaches at Andrews Theological Seminary. Andrews Theological Seminary is the official seminary of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. And whenever Dr. Hannah comes on this program, I, I love my best way of describing it, that it is advanced theology, uh, advanced theology. And so you, we are, I invite you to, um, to prepare to reason on some deep theological thought. And so I just want to thank you for joining us. With that being said, Dr. Hanna, I want to go back now to the text that you share with us, Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. And I'm going to read from the King James Version. He said, because, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shewed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What is the Bible really saying to us here, Dr. Anna, based on these two verses that we're saying? Are you saying that um, God is revealing himself in such a way that if we want to reason, then we can reason from a certain perspective and there will be no excuse uh, to deny that God exists? Is that what he's saying to us? 
I think so, yes. It's, it's telling us that our faith is not blind faith, uh, but that God has revealed himself to us in the things that he created. So the world around us is God's creation and the evidence of God's existence shines through the things that he has created. And so God is encouraging us to study the things that are created so that we would see the evidence for his existence. Now, it still takes faith to fully comprehend the evidence, but it's not a blind faith. It's a faith that's informed by evidence, and that evidence can be found in the world around us. In fact, the text also says that some of the evidence is found on the inside of us because it says God has revealed it to them and has revealed it in them. So our very human nature and our very ability to reason and to think is one of the evidences for the existence of a God who thinks and reasons and has created us in his image. So I think this is reasonable evidence that could be interpreted in support of faith in the existence of God. Indeed, I appreciate it. I also want to read verse 21. He said, because that when they knew God, they glorify him not, as God neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Uh, the Bible said when they knew God, they worship him not. So is it, a, can we get ourselves in trouble when God reveal himself to us that he exists, and when we refuse to worship him, it appears as if um, God hold it against us. Is that, is that a fair assessment? That <laughs> You could put it that way. Uh, another way of putting it would be to say that when we mix our faith with our reasoning, it produces uh, an enlightenment of the mind. But when we mix our reasoning with unbelief, it produces a darkening of the mind. In other words, faith mixed with reasoning, according to this text, faith mixed with reasoning results in improved reasoning. But unbelief mixed with the reasoning results in a darkened reasoning. Now, of course, this is the biblical point of view. Those who do not believe in the scriptures might have a different point of view than this. But it's important for us as believers to recognize that God is challenging us to mix our faith with our reasoning so that our reasoning can be improved. This is the biblical point of view. For those who are not believing the biblical point of view, we might you know, say in a time of ignorance of the biblical point of view, we could give them a break. But for those of us who claim to be believers in God's word, we have no excuse for not studying his creation to discover the evidence for his existence. And when we stretch our minds, when we stretch our reasoning power in that way, our faith mixed with our reasoning powers produces an enlightenment and an improvement of our reasoning. But from the biblical point of view, when we mix unbelief with our reasoning, it can lead to problems. And so the unbeliever looks at the same evidence and sees that, that there is no God. The believer looks at the same evidence and says, there is a God. What makes the difference? Faith versus unbelief. And the question is, which one is better? Do I, do I have a better chance of discovering the truth when I mix faith? with my study of the evidence? Or do I have a better chance when I mix unbelief with my study of the evidence? For those of us who are Bible believers, faith makes us wiser, not less wise. <laughs> you know, I, I have one follow-up question, Dr. Pa Dr. Hanna, and then I'm gonna pause and let the, the wider audience in, in, in part of the discussion. How would you, that if, if, play, if faith plays such a significant role for the believers and if faith is so important, and even those that are not believers would admit that they, are, they, they have faith, they may describe it differently, may say that they don't have religious faith. Now, but maybe religious faith or non-religious faith based on the perspective of one who believe in faith. How would you define faith then if faith is so significant to the process, to the process in getting to know and to, and to think in a certain manner? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
But before I, I try to define it, um, let's point out that in Paul's day, the, the, the faith versus the unbelief was faith in the true God versus unbelief in the true God, which meant faith in false gods. And if you read that chapter carefully, it says, because they didn't see the true God in the creation, they worshiped false gods and they, they worshiped the creature rather than the creator, which means that they chose to worship parts of the creation rather than to worship the creator of the creation. And so in Paul's day, it was a choice between a true faith and a false faith. And Paul saw the true faith as the faith in the God who created the universe. And he identified as false faith or idolatry, the faith in these parts of creation that people regarded as divine. Now today in our 21st century world, uh, very few people have that kind of unbelief where they actually worship parts of the creation as if they were gods. But the principle of the text still applies because you have still to choose, do I believe that the universe was created by God or do I believe that the universe is the ultimate reality all by itself without needing a God? And if we claim that the universe itself is the ultimate reality, in a certain sense, we are regarding the universe as if it is God, because that's what it means to, to believe in God, which comes back to your question about how do we define faith? What does it mean to have faith in God? Uh, faith is examining the evidence and then going beyond the evidence to lay hold by faith on the ultimate reality, which for us as believers in the Bible, is the ultimate reality of God. My faith in God is my trust in God, my personal relationship with God, my conviction that he is and that he exists and that he's the creator of the universe. If I don't trust in God and have faith in God and lean on his everlasting arms, then I'm likely to trust in something else that is not God and, and those who treat the universe itself as if it's the ultimate reality might be in danger of trusting in the universe. They mightn't call it faith, as you put it. They don't profess religious faith. But practically speaking, human beings have to trust something. We have to trust someone. And right now I'm sitting on a, a chair that I trust will hold me up. And I'm using this internet technology to talk to you, which I trust will continue to work until our program is over. And so we, we trust whether we think about it or not. And so while we may not worship the idols that people worshiped 2000 years ago, uh, in a spiritual sense, from a theological point of view, we still are in danger of, in principle, worshiping a false God when we trust other things for our security and trusting the ultimate reality, which is God himself. It's, it, as a matter of clarification, you said something, I, 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 and I want to make sure that I, I understood what you're saying. So you're saying faith then for you is to examine the evidence and go beyond the literal evidence and attribute it to God. That's part of what faith is. In the context of this current discussion that we're having, mm -hmm. uh, to have faith in God is to believe that he is. And, you know, it's, it's written that way in Hebrews chapter 11. He who comes to God must believe that he is. So that's the first level of faith, to just believe that God exists. The second level of faith is to trust God, to be in a love relationship with God, to have confidence in God. You know, you could believe God exists, but still you're fighting against him. You know, you're in rebellion against him. And that's what sin is all about. So I would say that one stage of faith is what we call intellectual conviction that God exists. But saving faith is leaning on the everlasting arms of God, trusting in God for salvation. It's a personal relationship with God as your savior and your creator. And that's the kind of faith we want to have as Bible believers. Uh, 
But as we said, there is that kind of secular faith that often we don't even think about as faith. But when one does not believe in God as the ultimate reality, then one falls back on other realities that we can trust, whether it be our family members, our government, or trusting the laws of nature and the universe itself. Uh, this is a kind of a secular faith that is not faith in God, but faith in the things that God created. Indeed, indeed. Uh, at this time, I'm going to pause and permit the audience to be a part of this, this dialogue. Any question or statement from anyone in uh, the audience? I know also Mr. Thompson with us, and I want to welcome us near and far. Anyone at this point, Mr. Thompson inclusive, included. First, um, I just want to check real quick, Dr. Hanna. Um, have you ever had a chance to read uh, Fyodor Dichevsky's Crime and Punishment? I haven't read the whole thing, but I'm familiar with the, the thesis of his book and the discussions that have been uh, followed up on that book. I'm familiar with it, yes. Okay, yeah, because I'm going through it right now. Um, the audio book, because you know, I'm legally blind, so I can't actually read it. Um, the only reason I'm bringing it up is it has one good scene in the book um, that I think fits with your discussion. Um, in this part of the book, um, one of the main characters murders two older women. And he actually manages to get away with it and somebody else gets blamed. Um, in the book, um, the, the two women live up on the top floor of an apartment building or something like that. And he goes there because that was his landlady. Um, and in the course of talking to her, he kills her. And then another woman who he didn't know was nearby came in, he kills her too. He manages to escape by going down one floor into a room that, um, some workers were working in and waits till they go up. And then he manages to leave the apartment building without anybody seeing him. In the course of the book, one of the painters who was working on that room that he went into is the one who gets blamed. Now, it's perfectly reasonable that people would blame one of the workers because nobody saw him go up there. All the evidence pointed towards one of the other people instead of the person who actually did it. Um, and the reason I thought this was actually fitting is because one word that I think that was missed in the discussion is the word knowledge. Both faith and evidence and reason can lead a person down the wrong road. Faith can be wrong or misplaced. Evidence can point to something that's incorrect. And even reasoning can lead you down of the wrong path, same as the guy who actually committed the murder for most of it. Like I said, I haven't actually finished it. I'm almost done. Um, but up till now, actually managed to get away with the murder because of the fact that all the evidence and all the reasoning that people used looking at the evidence pointed in the wrong direction. It didn't point to him. Um, nobody saw him go up the stairs. Nobody saw him come down the stairs. And there was nothing there that would say that it was him. So the reason I say that knowledge is more important as far as we can get towards actual have, actually having knowledge. You know, on my philosophical point, I'm a big believer in Rene Descartes' point about I think, therefore I am, and methodical doubt, you know. But at some point, we have to have, say, that, okay, this is knowledge. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is my personal issue with religious faith is as, um, Pastor Barnaby mentioned last week, he mentioned that I have to, that if I go to sleep, um, I have faith that I'm going to wake up. Most secular types of faith, um, is something kind of like that. 
the thing is, and I thought about it, is that within 24 hours, I'm going to actually have knowledge. I'm no longer going to have faith because at some point I have to go to sleep and I will wake up. My only real problem with religious faith is that I have to die in order to actually get any knowledge. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, well, much of what you've said I agree with. Uh, your high value on knowledge is something that I respect. And uh, even though I didn't mention knowledge in my brief presentation, I too value knowledge very highly. What I am suggesting is that from the biblical point of view, when we use our faith and our reasoning, then our reasoning is more effective. And one way of saying that is to say that our reasoning will be more likely to, to direct us to true knowledge. If we, if we mingle faith and reason, it contributes toward the discovery of valuable knowledge. And I think this is true even with secular faith. Secular faith and reasoning can evaluate the evidence and come to knowledge as well. And so I think knowledge should be valued uh, by both believers and unbelievers. So as far as that is concerned, I agree with you 100%. Uh, on the matter of whether we have to wait until after death to get knowledge, I think that would not be my position. That's not my faith position. I think we can begin to have knowledge in this life. Uh, of course, there can be increased knowledge in the life to come, but I don't think we have to wait until after death to begin to know anything. I think there is much that we can know in the here and now. So I wouldn't make a hard and fast line in the sand between, between knowledge on the other side of the line after death and pure faith on this side of the line before death. I think, I think faith and reason can assist us in discovering true knowledge uh, in this life where we now live. So that, that would be my, my position. Okay, is it a knowledge that can be shared with other people? Yes, yes. Uh, that's what Christians do when we, we say we share our faith. We, we preach the gospel. We are sharing things that we believe that we know to be true. <clears throat> uh, this raises an interesting okay. question, which goes back to your study of that novel about the evidence in that crime. Um, and maybe a brief comment on that would be would be suitable at this time as well. Uh, the evidence available to those who were doing the the investigation led them to conclude that an innocent person was guilty. But I would suggest that there might have been other evidence that was not available to them. That if they had that evidence, they would be able to discover the true criminal. Uh, and from a Christian point of view, from a religious point of view, our relationship with God allows us to have access to evidences or to perceive evidences that might not be perceived otherwise. And so we don't think that being a believer, trusting God, uh, believing scripture makes us devalue knowledge or automatically disqualifies us from being able to to discover the evidence. We would argue that it actually opens up to us evidences that we might have missed if it were not for uh, God uh, assisting us in discerning that evidence. Um, can I say something? Sure. Yes. Okay. So Hebrews 10, 35 to 37 says, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. But I want to concentrate on cast not away, therefore, your confidence. As people who believe that there is a God, and the true and living God um, is the creator, um, it behooves us as we are in discussion that faith is needed in order to have that confidence in the living God. 
However, I want to also say that because he is God, he we we as people, he will, I can't remember the word, he would encourage us by giving us evidence. But because he's God, he doesn't need evidence. He doesn't need to give us evidence. He doesn't need to uh, appease us. But because he knows that we are frail in our faith, he will give us evidence because he can always upturn evidence um, or, or things that are logical. Like when he gave Moses the rod and he said, when you cast it down, it will become a snake. And so the magicians, well, we could do that too. So they had faith in what they had and they had snakes too, but then God's snake swallowed up all the other snakes. Um, we know that an ax head is supposed to drop in water because it's heavy, but because God wanted to prove himself to those who are faithful in doing his will, building a school for the prophets, he let that ax float on the water. So he defies things that could be evidence, but he gives us evidence so that we could have something to hold on to if we are weak in our faith. I'm done. Yeah, interesting points, interesting points. Uh, I think I get your point and I agree with it in general. Uh, I think it has to do more with uh, uncovering evidence that we might have missed rather than so much defying the evidence. Uh, okay. But that's maybe just my preference of words. I think I agree with the point you're making. God can provide evidence to support our faith, but our faith uh, often has to go beyond the evidence because God might be up to something that we cannot understand. And that's what we call miracles, like the miracle of the ax head floating. Um, God could have given them the explanation for how he did it, but they wouldn't have been able to understand the explanation. So the evidence would have been useless to them. Uh, today, human beings build great ocean going vessels out of metal. And, and we know how to make metal float by the way we shape the metal and create an iron ship that floats. But, uh, but in those days, you know, they didn't know how to do that. And so God would not have accomplished anything by demonstrating to them the scientific laws by which that worked because they were not scientifically mature enough to be able to handle that evidence or that information. Uh, but I think I'm saying the same thing as you are saying, and that is that God being God uh, can do things that might appear to us to be contrary to the laws of nature, uh, appear to us to be absolutely unbelievable. And yet we receive those evidences by faith, even though we can't understand it. Uh, you know, some, someone might, might um, be, a, you know, apparently going to be in a fatal car accident, sliding on an icy highway, and it looks like they're, they're goners. And then somehow, miraculously, they survive the accident. They don't know how, but they say, thank you, Jesus. And they give the credit to God. But they can't demonstrate to an unbeliever that it was God who saved them. They just believe it. And God doesn't always come down and explain to us how he saved us. Sometimes it's just an unexplained miracle. Uh, in that sense, uh, God goes beyond the evidence or contrary to the evidence. But in a literal sense, uh, God never literally contradicts the evidence. It's just that we don't have the evidence. We don't understand the evidence as he does. And we sometimes are unable to understand it, depending on our level of knowledge. So that's the way I would put it. Uh, but yeah, God is God is into evidence, and God is into the laws of nature and the laws of creation. After all, He is the one who created it, and and through those very laws of nature, through the way the creation functions, we see the evidence for the Creator, the evidence that God exists. But we don't fully understand who He is and how He did what He's doing, as Brother Thompson says after death, we'll get some more answers. 
But we do have some answers, some evidence, some knowledge in the here and now as well. And that's good. Well, what I was going back to, Dr. Um, um, Mr. Thompson, is that you're stressing that knowledge. And I, I just want to let you know that we are with you 100%. In fact, one of the reasons why you and I get become such a great friend is because I recognize that your 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 God of, uh, for me your God has blessed you with a brilliant mind, and even if you look on this show, um, Dr. Hunter is a man of faith, but yet he worked through the regular processes and obtain a, a PhD that is recognized and not just among Christian but also within the, the, the non-Christian as well because he believe in knowledge just like, just like you stressed. Dr. Payne, we often share in this show not just have one but three different PhDs in three different areas that is credited by um, secular and Christian university because they believe in knowledge and I believe in knowledge and so knowledge is a very important aspect of the Christian tradition and the Christian faith. In fact, the Bible name one man in the Bible as the wisest man, and is Solomon. And Solomon, who the story you I know you're probably familiar with it as well, uh, was a king. And when he took over the leadership from his father David, he asked God and said, "God, as God asked him, what do you want?" And what he asked God, God, give me knowledge. And as such, God bless him. And he concluded that uh, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. And if you, if you read about Solomon, not just among believers like ourselves, but even atheists, agnostic will study history and recognize that this man was one of the wisest men. Even politicians sometimes quote some of the work that, that Solomon has done. And he concluded that being the wisest man, both in the secular realm and in the spiritual realm, that the knowledge, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Yeah, this is a very important point. It doesn't mean that... that that you know, uh, Christians therefore win the argument, but it's important when we have these discussions to recognize that many Christians <clears throat> do indeed uh, honor and value knowledge and reason along with faith. The two things go hand in hand. And so, uh, so the question is, uh, how do we tell the difference between true knowledge and counterfeit knowledge, you know? Um, I was in a discussion just just recently this week with someone online who who fell into saying that science debunks theology and debunk, debunks religion and debunks the existence of God. And I, I said to him, please let me know which science it is that has proven that there is no God, because I want to go and study that science and learn what they what they proved. But the, the fact of the matter is that science doesn't actually claim to have disproved God. Um, science doesn't claim to have the tools and the ability to answer the question as to whether or not there is a God. Now, there are philosophers who, who might argue for or against the existence of God, but the scientific method itself uh, doesn't, as I understand it, claim to be able to answer a question like, is there a God? or not, which raises the question, does, does science have the monopoly on knowledge? If science cannot establish for us that there is a God, does that then mean that believing in God is unreasonable and irrational? Um, could there be philosophical reasons for believing in God? And could there be theological reasons for believing in God, which go beyond the, the realm of science? Is there knowledge on different levels, knowledge in science, knowledge in philosophy, and knowledge in theology. For those of us who are believers, knowledge is available in all these different disciplines. Uh, so that's just something to think about as we engage in the dialogue between uh, believers and unbelievers. It doesn't mean that the believer automatically wins the discussion, but the argument from knowledge can be made on both sides. 
Thank you, Dr. Anna. Also, I, I, I recognize that I think Ella William has a question. Ella William, please, if you could unmute your device and pose your question or statement, please. I appreciate you, uh, Pastor Barnaby, and greetings to the family. Doc, how are you? I'm doing well. Good to, good to hear you, Elder Williams. This is, yes, I can see. This is an ongoing discussion in this vein here. Uh, let me try to analyze something. I'm trying to ask a question, but uh, the court system, since the evidence is, came up, in the court, is it a fact that lawyers would normally um, follow the evidences in order to find the truth? And uh, uh, for example, if a person, if they saw a dead person with the evidence, uh, it's not a, it's not the truth that that person was murdered. It could be something else. So, is it a fact that they follow evidence in order to reach the truth? I think within limits, it's safe to say so. The goal is to collect evidence, mm -hmm. and of course, the lawyer's primary job is not to collect the evidence, although. He, the lawyers can sometimes do that. Uh, usually the evidence is supposed to be collected by the police, the detectives, the investigators. They're supposed to collect the evidence and then they turn over the evidence to both the prosecution lawyer and the defense lawyer. <clears throat> and of course, sometimes lawyers go out of the way and go and look for additional evidence that maybe the investigators didn't find. But, but evidence is important to the legal system. And some evidence must be the basis for deciding guilt or innocence. <clears throat> so, and, and the goal is to discover the truth. Now, right. this doesn't mean that in every case the, the truth was actually discovered, because sometimes the innocent no. do go free, which is the point of Brother Thompson's uh, illustration at the start of our discussion. There are cases where there's a miscarriage of justice a misunderstanding of the evidence, and the innocent can go free. But the aim is to interpret the evidence and to present the evidence with enough clarity so that we can discover who is innocent and who is guilty. And that would be the truth of the matter. That's the goal. Right. Amen. And once they do that, they will find the truth, no matter what the team, who is the team or whatnot. So uh, I heard you laid out... Um, that God has evidences that actually lead to him as a true God in nature and in, you know, other things that we may mm -hmm. experience. Those are God's evidence. But as you say, we have to have enlightened faith to follow the evidence to God, right? Mm -hmm. So all of God. God's evidence, um, in spite of man, in spite of knowledge, of philosophies, all of God's evidence that he has laid out, if we follow it, it should lead to the truth. Is that the case? Yeah, if, if it's Anybody rightly understood, it. rightly interpreted, it will lead us to the right. conclusion that God exists. Yes. Right. Okay, so we can say then that those who follow the, there are some of us who um, are led by the evidences to the truth, while some of us may not be able to find the truth, who is God, right? Yes, and this, this is the difference. Sometimes this is the difference between faith and unbelief, uh, because as is presented in Romans 1, uh, God has revealed the evidence to everyone. Everyone has access in general to the evidence. Now, some of us may have more than others, 
but everyone has some evidence. God has revealed himself to everyone. But some people, as you pointed out, uh, follow the evidence to the, the religious conclusion that God exists. Other people look at the same evidence and draw a different conclusion. So what is it an excuse for agnostics and all the other people who can't follow them? Is it that they are not able to, they don't, well, the, the, the basic of them is uh, I don't know. Because I spoke to Brother Thompson once and he said, I don't know. And I asked him, how does he know that he, that he doesn't know? So uh, if the evidences are there and if you impart the evidence or try to show the evidence to somebody, uh, it goes back to their choice whether or not they want to follow it in that trend or it will take them somewhere else. Is that the case? Yeah, choice is a factor that, that plays into this. And that brings us right back to what we have been discussing for a number of weeks, the whole question of uh, to what extent do we have choice? To what extent do we have freedom? Is the evidence so conclusive that we really have no choice? The evidence forces us to be unbelievers or the evidence forces us to be believers? Or is there limited evidence and ambiguous evidence and so that free choice can play a role in it. The, this is one way of, of putting the issue. Uh, so let's, let's put it another way. Even if we are absolutely convinced that there is a God, this does not necessarily mean that we will have a faith relationship of surrender to God. One can be convinced that there is a God and conclude that he's not a good God and that we should not surrender to him, that he is an evil God. In fact, uh, this may be an opportunity to bring Brother Thompson back into the discussion as well, because the book he's reading uh, has been used, if not by the author, by those who read the book, to argue that because of the evil things that happen in the world, if there is a God, he must not be a, a smart God or a good God or a God worthy of worship, because if he was, he would have made a better world in which criminals don't escape uh, being detected. And so, uh, yeah, the evidence seems to be able to be interpreted in two different ways. One person interprets, interprets the evidence in such a way that she is led to faith. Another person interprets the evidence in such a way that she is led to unbelief. But there's evidence in both cases, you see. Both in the case of belief and in the case of unbelief, there's evidence. Now, someone might say, how do you know that? Well, I'm just sharing with you my biblical worldview. From the biblical worldview, God has given the evidence to everyone to one degree or another. And we have the responsibility now for responding to that evidence with faith or unbelief. What is problematic sometimes in these discussions is that in our secular society, it's assumed that unbelief is a more reasonable choice than faith. And so my argument here is to say, well, faith can be a reasonable choice too. Faith and reason can go hand in hand. I don't have to shut down my reason. I don't have to turn off my reason in order to interpret the evidence in a way that leads to faith. I can give a reasonable explanation of how the evidence supports my faith. I recognize that the unbeliever can also give a reasonable explanation for how the evidence as they interpret it supports their unbelief or even their agnosticism. So for the purposes of discussion, I want to keep the, the discussion ground level and not pull rank and say, I must be right because I'm, an, I'm a believer. Uh, I do think I'm right, but for the sake of discussion, uh, we don't pull the rank on the other person. And the, uh, the, the agnostic shouldn't pull rank on me either and say, well, because I'm an agnostic, I'm the wisest one at the table. 
or, or the atheist says, because I'm an atheist, I'm the only one here who is thinking right. But we need to give each other the benefit of the doubt and say, from a human point of view, we may all be very intelligent, may all be very reasonable, but somehow we're interpreting the evidence differently. So come, let's reason together. Let's reason together, let's explain how we move from the evidence to our conclusion and compare notes with each other. And in the process, we'll all be wiser by understanding the way each other is reasoning. And we may end up at the end all believing the same thing, or we may not. And it's okay. Yep. <laughs> it's okay. In the end, God will be the judge of who is right and who is wrong. In, in that principle, Dr. Honor, I would, call, I would like to, in, uh, to, to invite Mr. Thompson back into the dialogue to maybe he may have a thought to, to respond to you or a question or a statement or to anyone else so far. Mr. Thompson, do you have a thought or a question? Yeah, um, I wanted to, um, you know, just answer... Um, I forget the gentleman's name. Ella um, Williams. Um, Mr. Williams. Mm -hmm. um, about evidence. Um, see, sometimes people might have different opinions on what exactly constitutes evidence. Um, I think that's where some of the problem comes in. Um, like, we keep using the word evidence without actually naming exactly what the evidence is. And from at least my point of view, um, I think I've explained over the last few weeks, my position on knowledge itself, which is that it's very hard to say from a philosophical point of view, what exactly constitutes knowledge um, itself because of the fact that um, when you think about it, most of our knowledge is secondhand. There's very, like, to use a popular example right now, there's still people out here who still believe that the earth is flat. You know, it's a very big movement right now, especially online. There's people out there with all sorts of websites saying that the earth is flat and that we're all crazy to believe that the earth is round. Now, the first thought is to laugh at them. Um, at least for me. Um, but when you really think about it, that's a bit of faith on my part. I've never been off the planet. I have no idea if the earth is actually round. I look at the horizon. The horizon makes it seem like the earth is round. I look up at the sky. I see the moon. I see the stars. They're all round. The sun is round. I've looked at books. Scientists have said the earth is round. We've sent supposedly rockets into space and and people have come back and said yeah the earth is round but i don't have actual experience with the earth being round i'm going completely based off of belief and what other people have told me things i've seen on tv and popular opinion so i can't say for sure that the earth is round i just choose to believe it i have faith in that um, but I have, but the evidence that's out there is something, once again, that I choose to believe the evidence that's put before me. I'm not a scientist. I can't go out and perform an experiment for myself to have actual firsthand knowledge and experience using something that I produced for myself. So when I ask somebody like Dr. Hannah, is there some evidence that you can share with me? You know what I mean? What I'm really saying is there's something that you could give me where I can conduct an experiment for myself. You know, that is the basis of science. And it's not that I think that secularists like myself, if I want to call myself that, have a low opinion of faith. Because at least in my opinion, we all live by faith of some sort. You know what I mean? In the absence of knowledge, there's only faith. Um, but the, the standard that science goes by is that if I conduct an experiment, I should get the same result as you, or if I say, this is how I did it. Then you should be able to go out all on your own, do exactly what I did and get the same result. 
And what I fail to find in religion is the ability to do that. So that's what I say about evidence is, is there some sort of evidence where I could go out, collect evidence for myself, perform an experiment and get the exact same result that you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not good question. Uh, what I appreciate about your, your comment is that you like, I uh, are interested in leveling the playing ground for the discussion. And that's, that's great. So you don't automatically assume that faith is a bad idea, as you as you put it, we all have faith of one kind or another. So faith does not automatically mean that the religious person is less intelligent or less reasonable than a secular person who also has faith. You make an, an important point also about secondhand knowledge. We have secondhand knowledge in science, and we have secondhand knowledge in, in religion as well. So, so there's much, as usually is the case when we have these discussions, Brother Thompson, there's much that we can agree on. Um, the, the point that I would push back on a little bit, not to say I'm right and you're wrong, but just to push on it from my perspective, is the, the expectation that uh, all evidence would be the kind of evidence that we would look for when we're studying the natural sciences. Uh, I, think, I think the natural sciences, for example, deal with a different standard of evidence than the kind of evidence that you look at when you're trying to find out who done it, who's the killer, <laughs> you know, who is the killer of the two women on the top floor of the building in the book that you were reading, that the way evidence is, is processed and assessed in order to determine uh, a, a legal case in the law court is different from the way that evidence is, is done in natural science. <clears throat> and then there is the question of philosophy. Uh, f- philosophy, uh, I think, is a valuable area of, of, of human academic intellectual discourse. And the, the philosophical arguments and evidences and logical uh, f- procedures and steps are very important, but they're not the same thing in every respect as the, the, the requirements of natural science. And then you have theological disciplines, you know, the theology of God, the study of God. And I don't think that it's the same thing to, um, to use evidence to come to scientific conclusions and to use evidence to come to, to, um, to conclusions in theology. Now, while we're on that point, let's take the issue of design, which is one of the arguments that religious people of faith use to to look at the world as understood by science, the same world understood by science. And they say, the more we study science, the more the world looks as if it's designed. And the Christian says, that's because there's a designer. And the scientist says, no, we don't need the hypothesis of a designer. It just looks like it's designed but the design evolved by chance. What appears to be design is not really designed. It evolved by chance. And for me, as a theologian as a, and as a philosopher, what we have here is not scientific evidence versus faith and unbelief, but we have scientific evidence interpreted by one person as support for faith and interpreted by another person as a support for unbelief. But the science has not proven unbelief. The science has not proven that there's no designer. All the science has done is to show more evidence that it looks like it's designed. And one person for philosophical or faith reasons concludes that God is the designer. The other person for philosophical or faith reasons concludes that there is no God who is the designer. In both cases, the evidence is the same. And I am not willing to yield that the person who concludes that there is no God is necessarily more reasonable in interpreting the evidence than the person who concludes that there is a God. I think from a philosophical and theological point of view, an argument can be made that the most reasonable conclusion might very well be 
that when things look as if they're designed, it may be because there is a designer. Mr. Thompson. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that's a perfectly reasonable position. Um, but in saying all of that, can't both sides just admit that they don't know? Yeah, I think I think that's correct, depending on how you define to know. Um, if if by no, you mean the kind of proof of knowledge that you would get in a scientific uh, experiment in a laboratory, then both sides have to admit that we don't know and we will never know. I don't expect that science will ever be able to prove experimentally that God does not exist. And neither do I believe that science will ever be able to prove experimentally that God does exist. I think it will always be a philosophical and a theological question. And so when it comes to the, the question of scientific proof as the measurement of what it means to know, then you're quite correct. The question is, are there other ways of knowing that are equally legitimate? Is, are there philosophical ways of knowing and are there theological ways of knowing and spiritual and religious ways of knowing? And should these ways of knowing be acknowledged as real, genuine paths to knowledge? And this, of course, is debated, but it all depends on what kind of knowledge we're talking about. Depending, if you're talking about purely scientific experimental knowledge, I would agree with you that both sides should agree that uh, science just cannot prove it one way or the other. If I, if I may, um, if I may come back to Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson, earlier and before Dr. Anna uh, give the explanation you mentioned about faith and you did acknowledge that all of us exercise some level of faith and I affirm that. Um, you, you further went on to, to, to share in respect to even as we deal with the, the, the subject of God. Uh, could, you, could you tell us a little bit more because there's a point that I want to make. Could you tell us a little bit more when you said early on that all of us exercise um, some level of, of faith. And then when you were saying that, you're at, you're, all you're asking for us to, is to be able to demonstrate to you or point you to a theory or whatever we, we use to come to the conclusion that God exists, that you can go and to be able to, to point to it and use the same method to come to the same conclusion. Could you tell us a little bit more? Because I would like to, I'd like to make a suggestion to you. Well, it's just that basically the difference between, say, faith and knowledge uh, is that the minute you have knowledge, you no longer really have to have faith because you have knowledge. Like, if I could go out, if I could hop on uh, a rocket and go into outer space, I would no longer have faith that the Earth is round. I could just look down at the Earth and say, oh, it's round, you know. Until then, at some basic level, um, all of my quote unquote knowledge of the earth being round is based on secondhand knowledge. Knowledge I either gained through a book, from reading it, from watching TV, from somebody saying the earth is round. Um, maybe a little bit of evidence, like I said, looking up in the sky and seeing that the planets are round, the sun is round, the horizon, when you look at it, it curves, so it, it assume it's round. But I don't have any experiential knowledge, meaning my own personal experience, which is basically the only kind of knowledge that I can really go by and say, yep, this is, this is knowledge. And even then, you know, if you go far enough down that rabbit hole, which I do sometimes, you know, you can't even call that knowledge, but I won't go down that rabbit hole. Um, but in terms of, um, what you're asking, it would be something where basically any person without faith can 
can, you know, because that's the thing. Um, when I listen to religious people, it always has to start with faith. And if you don't have faith, well, then that's a bridge that can't be crossed. You know, it's basically how do you have evidence for somebody who doesn't have faith? Okay, I I, I would like to I like I like I like to answer you um, in two parts. Uh, first, uh, I I want I want to share with you an experience that I had. I, I was once in a secular university, and I was talking to a scientist. And this is a scientist that, from my understanding, uh, is a sci- is, it wasn't a Christian scientist. And he taught, as he was teaching us, he said, he said to the entire class, you know, the older I, be- I become, the more question I have. And he was speaking from a perspective that uh, the, the more he learned as a scientist and discover that things is more complex and complicated than he was first thought it to be, to, he thought it in the first place. And, and, and I want to I link that now to what you mentioned and as, as the first part of my, 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 my answer to you. First, you mentioned that it, if you have knowledge, then you don't longer need faith. And you use the example that, for example, you could, if you have the opportunity to take a, a, a space shuttle, you could just go to moon and you could look down and see that the earth is round and then as such you don't need to exercise faith. I would like to share with you from that science, from my experience by talking with that scientist. Even if you were able to jump on a space shuttle and go to moon and look down and you see that the heaven, that the earth is round, I would like to suggest that after you discover that it is round, you will be, as you keep looking at it, you will see something even more complicated and sophisticated that it will want more knowledge for you to, to dig more, dig deeper. So at all time, you, your knowledge will not be sufficient, sufficient to explain uh, the, 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 oh, God is designed in this world. So at some point, you're always going to need faith. That's, that's one point that I suggest and I'd like to make. And the second point that I would like to give answer to, when you, you, thought, you think you, you talk about a scientist, what scientists does, they develop a, a, a method, if you may, and that method they could give it to anyone, and anyone could interpret that method and come to the same conclusion. I think also that is also applicable to Christians. For example, myself. Um, before I know God, I used to think differently and act differently before I come to the knowledge that God exists. And when I come into a relationship with God, He changed the way I think and the way I act. Also, when I talk with fellow believers, they also have some experience of how God have changed them from one person to the next to act a certain way. The knowledge of God have them to think differently and have me to think differently. So my question to you now, is it possible that you could see us as Christian, how based upon our personal knowledge with Jesus Christ, how Jesus have done something personally within us. And all of us as believers have this unique story because we have experienced how God have transformed us in one way or the other. And so that's now become our scientific um, theory or a model that if you, exp- if you should follow that method by giving your heart to Jesus Christ, then you will have the same experience as we are having as believers. Um, I don't think so. But because uh, can you, uh, in the interest of time, can you at least open uh, your mind to, to the possibility of exploring it? And this now I become a, this now become a, okay. the theory or the method that you're asking for us to point you to, and this now become our our theory, our, 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 our hypothesis. This is this is what we as Christian claim. We have experienced it individually and collectively. We all can speak uh, uh, um, simultaneously yeah, in the same manner. But the, 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 the word, operative word you used was individual. Like the difference between an individual experience and something that I could go out 
an experiment or do something, as Dr. Hanna was saying, there's no scientific way to prove it. You know, and the difference between individual perspective and, you know, my own personal perspective is that unfortunately, as human beings, our limitation is we can't live within each other's body or in each other's mind. Now, there's always a chance that with any group of people, some of those people are going to have similar experiences. Um, For example, there are many examples throughout history where lots of people have mass hallucinations, similar experiences. Not saying that's what the religious experience is, but I'm just giving an example where throughout history there have been people who have had similar experiences or mass hallucinations or things to that effect. My basic problem is, like earlier in the dialogue, um, Dr. Hanna, I believe, mentioned that there was a time that people worshipped false gods. Um, Now, me as an agnostic, um, I basically have no reason to place more weight upon the existence of Yahweh, or whatever name you want to give to God, and Zeus or Odin or any other gods you want to name throughout history. There have been many. Um, So that becomes a problem. When you talk about belief and faith, or especially the word belief, is that at the end of the day, it's something that you believe. You know, it's not something that you necessarily know. Thank you very you much. You just believe. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. But because Dr. Hunter is our chief honored guest here, I want to go back to him and give him the final thought. Uh, Dr. Hunter. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, a, it's always a fun discussion, and I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, what's important for me is a couple of things. One we mentioned already tonight, and that is keeping the level ground of the discussion so that we, we talk with each other uh, as we have been doing with respect and uh, and courtesy, recognizing that the person who disagrees with me is not necessarily irrational. Uh, there might be other reasons for disagreeing other than lack of reason. So so that's that's very important. The next thing that's very important we also mentioned, and that is that there may be different levels of knowledge, and I think it's a mistake to assume that we should expect the same kind of natural scientific evidence to be used to settle the argument as to whether or not God exists. Uh, Natural science is relevant. It helps us to understand the creation. Uh, Of course, I call it a creation because I believe in God. The unbeliever might call it an evolution. But but natural science helps us to understand the physical world around us. But it, it is not able with natural science experiments to settle the question of whether or not uh, there is a creator for this world. And so we have to accept that, and I think we all do. We already acknowledge that in our discussion this evening. So that raises the question of what are the methodologies, and you kind of was getting to this, Pastor Barnaby, what are the methodologies and the approaches and the techniques and the, the, the rational processes that we go through in order to lead ourselves or to be led to the conclusion that there is a God. And I think these processes are reasonable. They're not exclusive of faith. As we said when we started the program this evening, faith and reason go hand in hand. But there there are reasonable ways to go beyond natural science in the disciplines of philosophy and in the disciplines of theology to have a reasonable discussion of the evidences that exist on these levels. And if we continue to to treat the natural science level of proof as the basis for settling the discussion, then we really haven't started the philosophical and the theological discussion yet. We have to, in my view, go to the philosophical level and then maybe beyond that to the theological level and to actually get up to speed as to how does one weigh evidence on these levels in order to make a decision concerning what is reasonable or unreasonable. 
And that's that's maybe where we have to leave it for today. We continue this discussion in the weeks ahead. So I'm sure we'll pick up here again if you need to wrap up soon, Pastor Barnaby. But this this is what I would say at this point. I think you're muted, Pastor Barnaby. Thank you, Dr. Anna. I thank you, Dr. Anna. Indeed, we truly appreciate it. Um, for those that just join us, we were honored guests this evening. We have Dr. Payne, our scientist, to give us an update in respect to the COVID-19. And we have Dr. Anna, our theologian. Dr. Anna is not just a theologian, but also a philosopher as well, a systematic a theologian. And we have uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, Elder... Williams and many, the Sister Mortley, the support of the discussion, and of course you, the audience, even though you have not posed a statement or a question, but just being here, you are part of what we're trying to, to accomplish. On this show, we only have two objectives. First, to glorify God. We believe that Jesus Christ is the creator of the world, the sustainer of life and maintainer of life. He's not just creator and sustainer, but he's also the redeemer because humanity fell into sin and sin equal death and Christ died in Calvary cross so we could have life and have it more abundantly. Also we have explored on yesterday's show that in John chapter 14 from verses 1 to 3 that God, Jesus said, I go on to prepare a place for you and if I go on to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and remove you from this sin-sick world. And so we want to thank Dr. Hunter uh, to grace us with his presence. We want to thank Mr. Thompson to being a part of this dialogue. And one of my final thoughts that I want to share with you, that the Bible says God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible also says to God, as Dr. Anna shared, that God wants to say, come and let's reason together. God wants us uh, to reason. So as a Christian, we believe in reason in a logical way from cause, from cause to effect. The Bible also stresses knowledge, that the, to know God is to know truth and to know knowledge. And Solomon, uh, one of the wisest men in the scripture, that is recognized not only uh, within the religious circle, but also recently I heard politicians quote and said, I don't have the silver bullet. I don't have the wisdom as Solomon. And some of those um, politicians are not necessarily claim the Christian faith. And so Solomon lived on this earth in a certain time period, and he concluded that the fear of God, and watch this for a second, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Mr. Thompson stressed the importance of knowledge. In fact, at one point, he even noted, made note that if he have to choose between faith and reasoning, he will choose knowledge. And Solomon said, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, just the beginning of knowledge. So when we continue to talk and reason, then our knowledge will expand. And that's the reason why I love when Dr. Hannah is here. Because when he's here with us, he stretched our mind to think about, think beyond the normal things that we're accustomed to think, even theologically. Even us who are believers in Christ, he stretched our mind to think and to reason from cause to effect. And this is what God is all about. This is who God is all about. Uh, Mr. Thompson, I love you. You have always been my, 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 may, may, let me just make this, admit, uh, just share this with the wider audience. When I first um, met Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson would define himself as an atheist. And another friend of ours, um, Mr. Okiki, Mr. Okiki uh, is from Nigeria. So African, he's African, and Mr. Thompson is American, and myself is from the Caribbean. And when we first get together, um, I was introduced to, to think intellectually from these three men, these two men. And they stimulate my thought. And so as he talk about knowledge, uh, it really bring me back when we first begin our relationship. And as we reason, and now we're here. I am a strong believer in God. And I believe uh, when he fully understand that all his desire could be fulfilled in God, he would be excited. That is my hope and that is my belief. And uh, he may not, he may not see it this point didn't mean a seat right now but i believe in the future he will he will at, at, least, at the very least it is my hope 
that he will get there. With that being said, I want to thank everyone. And Dr. Hanna, uh, I know we have spent a few minutes more than what we usually plan. And so with that being said, would you do us one more favor, please? Would you pray a blessing over us uh, that God will do something for us and even strengthen our knowledge and our faith in him? Thank you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, prayer for us who believe is like the breath of the soul. And so while we formally close this meeting with prayer, uh, we have been praying all the way through from beginning to the end, for we cannot go very long without breathing. And so we pray that you would help us to continue to practice the discipline of prayer so that we will be filled with the life of your spirit for the entering of your spirit gives life. We thank you so much for the privilege we have had to fellowship with each other and to dialogue with each other, to reason with each other. Truly iron sharpeneth iron. And we thank you for the assurance we have that your Holy Spirit was involved as well from beginning to the ending. We pray now for those who are physically sick, that you would be their great physician. And if it is your will that you would work a miracle of healing, we pray for those who are emotionally discouraged, that you would encourage them, help them to turn their eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face. So the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. For those who are bereaved because of the loss of loved ones, we pray that you will be to them the great comforter. We sorrow not as others who have no hope. We look forward to the blessed hope of resurrection of those who sleep in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for giving to us the gift of reason and the gift of faith. Whether at this time our faith and our reasoning is secular and scientific, or whether it is theological, we thank you for these gifts, the gift of faith and reason. And help us that as we use these gifts that you have given us, we would grow in grace and grow in knowledge. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. And for his sake, let everyone say amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hannah. I, again, on behalf of all of us, not just us on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, but also on behalf of our heavenly family and our Commander-in-Chief commander himself, Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. We want to thank you once more time to share your giftedness with us. We are better suited for heaven because of what you have shared with us. And again, we say thank you. You're welcome, Pastor Barnaby. All right. And I, I just want to, sh one quick note I want to share with us. On next Thursday, next Thursday, our 100 guests are going to be um, Chief Owen, uh, rather Sheriff Owen. Sheriff Owen is the first um, African-American sheriff um, elected in Georgia, Cobb County. And we're going to talk about um, the issues surrounding um, police killing of a young black man. And so we want to hear his perspective as our chief. Uh, in my county of Cobb County, he's of, um, is a ch um, chief uh, of police. And so we want to hear his perspective. What, is his, what does he expect from us as citizens? What does he expect from his officers? And when we are pulled over as black men and um, our black youth, what are some of the things that we can do um, to lessen the tension between law enforcement and us as young black men? And the objective is hopefully we can have a healthy dialogue and how as young black men, our young our black men, we can be able to get home to our family safely versus getting to the morgue. Because at the end of the day, no money in the world worth our life. And so we want to enter into a healthy discussion where we want to love and respect 
our, our, law, our police officers, but at the same time to find out how can we work together in, in, a, in a civil conversation. So I want to tell you from now, but it's going to be not this Thursday, but the following Thursday. Again, God bless you. Looking forward for us to be here tomorrow when we will continue this dialogue, when we will focus on the secret to live forever happily, which we concluded this far, that is because of what Jesus Christ has done and covered across and behalf of all of us. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Good, night. Good evening. Good night.